Okay. This is the Alpha Human Podcast, and I am your host, Lawrence Rosenberg. Our guest today is Douglas Laux. Doug is an ex-CIA operative who was assigned to some of the most dangerous hotspots in the global war on terror in an effort to penetrate the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And he served in Afghanistan and Syria. He has been recognized for his heroism and dedication to our country by Senator Sherrod Brown, as well as Congressman Warren Davidson and Jim Banks and Governor Ron DeSantis. Doug is also the New York Times bestselling author of Left of Boom, how a young CIA case officer infiltrated the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Doug also created, wrote, produced, and stored in the Discovery Channel's Finding Escobar's Millions and was part of the Bravo Channel series, Spy Games. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, Lawrence. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, the book, Left of Boom, was absolutely fascinating. I tore through it uh, uh -huh. and then just kind of went back to it a bunch of times because there's, I mean, the story itself is so, your story is, it's, well, it's insane. Um, <laughs> but it is unbelievably compelling and intriguing, and you can't put the book down. Um, you were at the CIA for, I guess it's seven or eight years, but yeah. in that time, you burned like a Roman candle. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so, so, white hot, like so much kinetic yeah. energy and intensity in the job you were doing in that yeah. space of time, in that condensed space of time, which is, which is more than most uh, most CIA uh, officers ever, ever get involved with their entire careers. So, I mean, just absolutely mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, well, I, they say that when you burn the candle at both ends, it gives off a more wonderful glow. So <laughs> I guess that's the philosophy I was taking by doing that. But since you did read the book, you see that it will have some after effects if you choose to keep it at 11 for that long. So... Yeah. yeah, that was certainly part about it. And if you want to talk about that stuff, we can. Uh, the world is your oyster right now. So just let awesome. me know. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that in a, in a little while. Um, I guess let's, I want to kind of jump into, you know, to somewhere uh, in the beginning. Uh, yeah. shortly, shortly after graduating um, from the University of Indiana, you're yeah. in this like six-figure job at DHL. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, you, you, you get the district salesman of the year award, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> and then next thing you know, you're leaving to, to work with the, the CIA. Like, what's that? What's going on there? What's that trajectory like? Get, fill, fill some of that in and how you yeah. end up going into the CIA. You know, great question. And it probably is a question I'm asked the most. The only social media platform where you can really find me is is reddit.com because okay. i did ask me any things before amas and so sometimes actually quite frequently people will send me like direct private messages and they always ask like hey how do i get in what should i put on my resume um you know what's like a secret back door and i always say well there is no back door to getting into the agency but i also have like heard former officers or professors suggest that you might get a phone call out of the blue and I don't know what other people's experience is or was but mm -hmm. as for me and for all of my friends that were case officers uh, you had to apply online and when I say that to like students who are seniors in college they're like what <laughs> for the CIA you know it's what do you mean apply online I'm like you got to remember it's still the federal government so they want to keep track of this, you know, like you can file a FOIA against it. So they're going to be, you know, crossing their T's and dotting their I's when it comes to recruitment as well. And um, so the only way to get in the CIA, as far as I know, and I'm not bullshitting you, like I have no reason to lie, mm -hmm. uh, is to apply online. And so you can see, you know, like a Pacino movie, The Recruit, where he's tasked with going and finding uh, Colin Farrell and he's recruiting him and he says call this number at this time 
as far as I know, that doesn't happen ever. And maybe it happened in the 70s, but as of now, and by the way, the CIA gets over 400,000 resumes per year. Wow. So they're like, and yeah, they're in like, the Wall Street Journal published that. They're in like the top 10 for people submitting resumes. Uh, That's insane. I never degree. knew that. Yeah. So it's always in the top 10 of resume uh, reception. And uh, so they don't need to send out Walter Burke, Pacino's character, because obviously I have that entire movie memorized. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, they don't do that. And if you think that that's going to happen to you, it's not. You got to take the initiative and you got to apply online. Now, some weird things will happen after that if they like you and they'll start, you know, sending out agents into the field to interview people from your past life. That will happen. They will go to your high school if they really like you and talk to former teachers and the principal and pull your records there and your college and everyone you've lived with for, I think it goes back like eight to 10 years, but um, that only happens after you apply online. So that really okay. is the first step. You got to, you got to just fill in the boxes at CIA.gov. That's the only way to get it started as far as I know. Okay. And, and so you do that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, again, you're, you're doing great at DHL, I guess. Um, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But all of a sudden, I guess the, you got the you got the call. Yeah. I mean, I applied online, and they told you, like, hey, oh, by the way, we may not tell you whether you are accepted or not accepted. And that's another problem that a lot of people have is they're like, hey, I applied online, like you said, and no one called me back. And I'm like, yeah, I read the fine print. They say like we may not tell you whether it's a yes or a no. You may hear nothing or you may hear from us immediately. They don't give you a time frame. So for me, it was pretty immediate. I filled in, you know, everything online. And I think I got a phone call within a couple weeks. And, uh, you know, I write about it in the book. It was kind of funny because I didn't know who it was. And I made the yeah. lady on the other line tell me, hey, we're with the CIA, like, dumb, dumb, like, wake up. Are you paying attention? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is the CIA? Oh, my God. Yeah, I want the job. And so they're like, I think the next step is, if you know what an SF-86 is, and that's no secret that I'm revealing, um, everyone who's applying for a clearance in the federal government or probably even state government, you got to complete what's called an SF-86 form. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like 40 pages, 50 pages long, just detailing everything you've done for like the past 12 years in your life. And it's really robust and intensive. You fill that out. And then if they like that, the process continues. So, yeah. But what, so what was, but what was the inspiration to do that? Because again, you know, you got one career trajectory going on here um, and looking good. Next thing you know, you're in the CIA. So, I mean, what was the impetus for you to make that choice to, to even apply? Well, you'll probably find over the course of our conversation here that A, I don't pull any punches and B, I'm kind of iconoclastic. Um, I'm not going to tell you it was for X, Y, Z or Z reason that, you know, patriotism or this or that. Certainly that was kind of part of it. But if you want to know the reason why I went onto the website and applied uh, was because I never thought it was possible. That's the honest answer. I mean, I was like, okay, I'm applying for all these jobs. You know what? I should just apply for the fucking CIA, you know, and I'm going to apply for the NSA too while I'm at it and the FBI, you know, and just <laughs> went to it and just applied. I mean, there was, I'm not going to pretend there was this like, oh, this foresight of I need to serve my country because in the back of my mind, I already had an officer for Marine candidate, officer candidate school. So the Marines were going to take me in a heartbeat. And so they're like, yeah, we'll be right here waiting. If things aren't panning out, we want you. Okay. So, you know, if it really was the patriotism in my blood, I easily could have taken that. I took the job with DHL because I was waiting on the CIA to make up their mind. And so I was doing pretty well in sales, but the CIA kept saying, okay, we like that hold. We'll eventually send you something. And then you'd get something a few months later. And then they'd say, now we want a writing sample. And then a few months would go by and then they'd say, okay, now you need to do this. And so I just kept working because I needed a living. And, you know, uh, mine took a really long time because uh, I'm from the sticks in the Midwest. And so mm -hmm. 
they had to go interview all of these people where there's not an FBI or like DSS field office nearby. So they were probably, I'm guessing, sending people from like either Indianapolis or Detroit, you know, both cities like three hours away Mm -hmm. to like do the background interviews where if I had been born and raised in New York, Manhattan, they could have probably have got it done in 30 minutes. You know, like it would have been a breeze. They would have just sent a team out and got it done and talked to everybody. So my process took a lot longer than what I later found out. Most of my friends, they're like, oh, yeah, it's real quick. It's like this. And I can't say how long mine was, but uh, let's just say more than a year. Wow. Okay. So you get to CIA and you're expecting Jason Bourne style training program, Uh right? (laughs) But, But you ended up feeling like a desk jockey, essentially doing like admin support for operations officers, <laughs> sending reports, making copies of yeah. files, and, and yeah. kind of like biding your time, waiting for a chance or hoping for a chance to get sent to the farm. What, what was that about? I mean, did you go, you went in there like with this mindset like, I'm in, it's the CIA, I'm going undercover. I mean, tell us yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. That was a real kick in the pants and a wake up call. Um, Yeah, I mean, look, I said I kind of joined on a caprice, which is the honest truth. Mm -hmm. But once I got accepted, and it was clear, I'm going to quit this job in Colorado and move to Washington, DC. My mindset shifted to now it's on. So let's get it on. Okay, so like, as soon as I accepted their offer, it was like, give me, you know, like a grenade launcher and drop me in <laughs> to the war zone. Cause I didn't know any better. I was naive. I admit okay. that. And, um, you know, I, I say looking back with like some perspective, the CIA did two really good things for me. They made me a hell of a lot smarter and they taught me how to like slow down, you know what I mean? And be patient because it's coming and you need to take the proper steps to get where we want you to be. You know, we want this, and you're going to become that or you're going to become nothing. So you're going to do it our way. And, you know, the military is very much like that, too. I, I worked for the military for three years after uh, I left the CIA. Okay. And, um, yeah, it's very structured because they want their final product to be this. So they know that they can rely on it and that you have the skills to go into the field and collect intelligence. And we don't need to hold your hand and we don't need to worry that you're going to get yourself killed. Or, hey, by the way, it is espionage. If you're caught, that's a huge gaffe. You're going to be on the cover of the New York Times and or the Washington Post, and everyone's going to cover it, and it's going to be your face, and they're going to unravel everything about you. So, like, they need to know that what they produce is at the level that they can trust. And, um, you know, sometimes things go sideways, and that's inevitable. But, um, yeah, by and large, you know, I got there. And uh, I, again, like every one of my colleagues had read every book about the CIA. And I had read uh, one. I read Robert Baer's book. um, And uh, I loved it. And I was like, I don't know if you read his See No Evil. And he's talking about taking a big swig of vodka Mm -hmm. and then loading an AK-47 and jumping out of a plane with all of these Russians and not knowing if his parachute's going to open. And I was like, that's me. And I've right. since met Bob Bear and he's a really cool dude. Wow. But you know, he's like me, he's a little bit loco, you know. And so when I saw him, I was like, I want to be that dude who takes a big pool of vodka and jumps out of a plane with the Russians over Kazakhstan. That's a story. And uh, you know, when I got there, I was like, hey, you need to make like 50 copies of this. And then I was like, how long does this go on for? And you know, like, is this the hey new rookie guy or whatever? And they're like, oh, years. I'm like, what? Oh. You know, like, you have to be kidding me, you know? And so, but looking back, like I said, it all makes sense now because you have perspective to go. Okay. You know, that was necessary because I would have got myself killed if even after the first year of training, you know? So, like, it takes time to learn the process. And by sitting and reading all the reports that are coming in from actual case officers in the field, mm-hmm. you're able to get perspective of them and how operations are done because they're writing to you well, they're writing a cable right for the u.s government to read who has a clearance to read it 
and I was privileged to read those depending on what desk I was on. And so I'm reading what people who I am wishing to become, how they're doing it. And they're telling me, hey, I did this, and then I did this, and I met the guy here, and it took this long, and here's why I decided to cut it short. This is how much I paid him and why I paid him that amount. I think he has this problem. He might have this problem, but he has this access, which is excellent. So you learn like right. what's necessary and what to report and what your policymakers want to know about. And um, just you, you don't get, there's nowhere you can read that without being, you know, in a CIA vault reading actual documents coming in from the field. So it is worth the while to take all that time. So then you go, yeah, I remember how, uh, case officer John Smith used to do it when he was in Afghanistan and he was good, but case officer Joe Smith sucked, you know, and like right. his cable sucked and his information sucked. And then Jane Smith was okay. You know, and you have this comparison to go, John Smith was awesome. And I love the way he even framed his writing. I'm going to write like John Smith. So, you know, it, uh, it really helped, even though I was pissed at the time. Once I was in the field, I was thankful for all those years I spent reading what others had done before me. You know, that's interesting, um, that, that perspective that you've gained. But I could see, again, from reading the book, your personality, you must have been like simmering because like you, I, lo I love the, the breaks that you take in between when you get your time <laughs> off. You're going yeah. like, you go to the Gobi, you go to the Gobi, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the Gobi yeah. Desert. Oh, uh, you running with the 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 bulls in Pamplona. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, you're you're just all right. I'm gonna go to Costa Rica. All right, I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, if somebody even in today's world, uh, pre-pandemic, but if somebody tells me they went on vacation, and they follow that with, it was so relaxing. I'm like, <laughs> don't even tell me anything else about your vacation because I'm sure I'll find it boring. Like I if I go on vacation, I need to relax afterwards. Like, because I will have like, if, it, because why? Because, you know, if I'm going to go to, I don't know, Colombia, I'm not just going to stay in Bogota, you know, I'm going to go to Medellin and I'm going to go to everywhere else throughout the country. And I'm going to go up the mountains. I'm going to go to the coast. I'm going to go to Barranquilla, you know, like I'm going everywhere. I want to see it all. And uh, so it'll be a whirlwind. And yeah, I did that on my R and R's and, it wore me out pretty nicely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you definitely paint that picture for sure. <laughs> uh, but you know, so, so you're, so you're there, you've got this adventurous, adventurous mindset. Yeah. You know, you're, you're itching for a chance and I'm going to quote now from the book. Okay. So you say one day I ran into a grizzled looking guy who just <laughs> returned from the war zone. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I told him I wanted to be doing the kind of stuff I was reading about in the newspapers, like recruiting sources and tracking terrorists. And he mm -hmm. said, Doug, you got to think about your career. You need to get the desk experience <laughs> yeah. you're getting now in order yeah. to advance. And, and you replied, fuck the career. <laughs> I, I, I want to do, do exciting, tip of the spear kind of stuff. Send me to Iraq or Afghanistan. And, and he ended up relenting and saying, all right, um, I'll put you in touch with a couple of people. Uh, but then you, he actually did put you in touch with, with some people about this. And when, when you met with them, they told you the chances of you going to a war zone was slight. And you asked why. And they said, because you're not a SEAL, you're not Delta, which means you don't have tier one operations experience. Right. What's the deal? What was that all about? Uh, well, I mean, let me clarify that in so much that, yes, we do send, because it was a war and the CIA obviously was active in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yep. I hope that's not a too revealing of a secret there. <laughs> uh, right. But we sent lots of people there. So what I mean to say is like those conversations that I was having uh, with the people who make those decisions was, look, I want to go to Afghanistan but don't you dare stick me in Kabul. I want to go to a forward operating base. I want to work at a black site. And that's when they were like, pump your brakes, bro. Like you don't have tier one experience. We're gonna send one of our paramilitary officers there, who's also a case officer, 
and that's who gets to go there, not you. And my mentality was, well, what can I do to change your mind on that? And um, it's a slippery slope because within the CIA, and I can only speak, by the way, from when I was there. So if it's changed, I hope somebody doesn't watch this or listen to it and go, that's not how it is now. (laughs) Okay, wham, sorry, guess what? (laughs) I left in 2013, so it's a good thing. I don't know how it is right now. Nobody should be telling me how it is right now. I don't have the need to know that. Um, But back then, as of 2013, um, uh, it it was, yeah, you're you're not suited for it. You're not fit for it. And there was a term that would float around up through, I don't know, I guess I first deployed in like 2010, uh, called a war zone CO, a war zone case officer. And mm. to the majority of people in what's now called the Directorate of Operations, it was called the NCS when I was an active officer. Um, the label war zone CO was something 95 to 98% of people wanted to avoid. So that grizzled guy that I was talking about that I, everyone knew Mm -hmm. he was a war zone CO. He had that moniker. And so to 95% of people, it was like, ugh, he's just a war zone CO. Uh, Like that's all he can do. And you get relegated to that. And they're only going to send you to war zones probably and invariably. I mean, and then again, somebody's probably watching you just going, no, you don't have to trust me behind the scenes. Like, If you're labeled a war zone CO, Mm -hmm. you probably like that because you chose to be that. And so you don't mind it, but everyone else is like, oh my God, if I ever got labeled a war zone CO, like my career would be over. He's never going to get promoted. He's never going to do traditional operations. And it's like, you look at mine after two years in the war zones, I did some really traditional stuff still in a war zone, Mm -hmm. but throughout the entire Middle East. So um, yeah, that guy. I would say, you know, he looked at me thinking like, you're just starting out. You don't want this moniker, man. You know, like you don't want to be a war zone CO. You're going to get stuck with all the shitholes. You're going to go to all the worst places on earth. If you get married, if you have children, it's going to suck. Like, no, don't, don't be like me. And I was like, you're everything I want to be. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, he relented and he got me hooked up. And then (laughs) I was kind of a brat back then. Um, like I said, I'm kind of, I always have been a renegade and they told me I wasn't going to go to Afghanistan. I was going to go to Iraq and they're going to keep me in Baghdad. And I said, that's fine. I'll just go on what's called LWAP, leave without pay. And I'll just go skiing for like six months until you change your mind. And they were like, what? Say it again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm going to quote that part of the book because it really shows where your mindset was before, before I do that. I think it's important to note because she kind of alluded to how like 95% of the case officers think and, you know, oh, he's just a war zone CO, you know, he's just a, you know, a break glass in case of emergency. He's just a broom, yeah. right? Yeah. Your colleagues, the, the way you describe it, I mean, they were happy to traffic in reports. They wanted the typical career trajectory. Yeah. They, they wanted to be assigned to uh, an overseas embassy, right? And work the cocktail circuit. Of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I don't know how far down that rabbit hole you want to go. I'll just touch it briefly. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go beneath the surface, we can, you got to understand that the vast majority of people that make it into the CIA and this offends people sometimes, and I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Um, the I stands for intelligence. Okay you do have to be ridiculously intelligent to get in. Okay. There's a reason why it's called central intelligence. You have to be wicked smart and not just like well-read, but like intellectually your processor has to fire at everyone else's RPMs bar none. Mm -hmm. And you won't make it through. Trust me. They're going to give you a battery of tests at our time. And if you don't get those scores that are required and you can't meet those tests or you don't pass those psychological examinations with somebody who has cleared 10,000 people before you and not cleared 200,000 before you, they've seen it all, um, you're not going to get in. You have to be smart. Well, guess what? What does that mean? 
it's kind of a double-edged sword. It means that most of the people that get in are from an Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or like went somewhere really impressive because if they didn't, they probably didn't take academics that important. They kind of just skated by college because they never thought the CIA was an opportunity for them. Right. Whereas people who went to high schools that cost $50,000 a year, I didn't even know that was a thing until I got in the CIA. And most of my contemporaries and people I started with had went to high schools that cost more per year than my entire college times five. Um, and then went to Yale or Princeton or Stanford or USC and had four degrees. And one was in Mandarin and the other one was in Arabic and a, a history degree and like a English literature degree. So they could outright me, you know, they could outspeak two mission critical languages and they had a huge understanding of history, you know? And so you're like, oh my God, best and brightest. Yes, absolutely. But again and not to wax on it but the double-edged sword to that is a lot of those people had been sheltered their entire lives and lived really mm -hmm. beyond upper middle class i don't know what is above up what is above the upper elite or rich i don't know what you call it i'll just be frank but they were all rich real rich not upper middle like rich and vacationed at their home in the hamptons and a lot of those people work for the cia and um you can find some people out there now who are doing television shows um, who claim to have worked for the CIA. I didn't know them, but they do live in the Hamptons. That's a fact. You can look them up on Instagram. And I'm kind of like, huh? But the other end of that, or the flip side of the coin, is they tend to kind of lack grit and haven't really met nasty people in their life. And they've never been punched in the face. And they've never seen anybody dead. And they aren't real suited for violence you know they didn't grow up in the trailer parks like i did you know what i mean like they didn't see abuse and neglect and just generally bad people and for me it was like oh that reminds me of ted you know <laughs> oh, hey yeah hey that's cousin jim over there you know like it was right. like yeah i could relate to these people whereas you know a lot of case officers will go we deal with the worst of the worst the scum of the earth and i'll go they're just humans too who got a bad rap and a bad role and oh by the way i want that guy to work for me so i'm gonna make him right. think i'm his best friend so um yeah i guess i shouldn't dive too much deeper on That's that great. but that is that is what i see as a pretty big complication uh with regards to even the onboarding process is i was always an outlier because you know i went to indiana university i grew up pretty poor and uh, so when I came in and I had read no books about the agency or, you know, much of anything, they were all like, how does he not know all of Shakespeare's plays? <laughs> I just don't understand how he can't quote that sonnet back to me. And I'm like, I don't know what that, what's a sonnet, you know? <laughs> and so I was a born knuckle dragger to come in there. So I guess being a war zone CO was most fitting for me anyway. Right, right. I mean, it, it's all... I mean, you know, I started wondering halfway through the book, well, not even halfway through the book, what am I talking about? Um, early on in the book, I started thinking to myself, why, you know, why didn't you? Um, well, and maybe you I think it's because you probably only figured it out once you were in the CIA, but I mean, clearly um, you could have been in uh, US Army Special Forces, Green Beret would have been like great for you. Yeah. Um, and, and, or, and, you know, any of the other, um, any of the other, spe uh, sp you know, the soft community would have been, uh, you know, a perfect yeah. match for what you wanted to do. And I'm, and I wondered to myself, why didn't you go into that? You wanted to do black ops so much, but then yeah. I think you only figured that out once you were in. Yeah. Uh, look, I've said this a thousand times because people generally, when I speak with them, they either see me as unfortunately, unless they spend enough time speaking with me, they see me as somebody who like, hates the organization or somebody that's stumping for them and it's neither i mean it's why i always point out i am so incredibly thankful to the cia for all of the training and everything i learned i mean it made me vastly a better human in every single capacity and i'm sure there's listeners or viewers who are like huh, made you a baby killer shut up um <laughs> i don't care what you think so 
Um, but man, they make you so smart. Like you had to be super smart to get in and they make you light years smart. It's like taking, wow. you know, the, the limitless pill, Bradley Cooper's movie and De Niro, like you just see things in other perspectives. And I know one of your former guests was on talking about the operational mindset. Mm-hmm. And when you unlock that and you start looking at things the way they want you to look at them, the world, it just, you view it through a different lens now. And then you realize like, and it's kind of scary and it scares people when they hear you say it out loud, you realize within seconds who you can manipulate and size up and who you should just leave alone. And so same as a criminal who's sitting on a you know porch, who should I try to knock over and take their wallet? And uh, that guy carries himself too well. It ain't worth it. Ooh, yeah, that guy with the slouch. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's instinctive. And so, yeah, you you get that. And um, it's it's pretty unique and pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, so look, that's my thing. Like mm. sometimes people think I'm stumping and they're like, oh, he's a stooge. Look at all the good things he said about the CIA. Well, read my book. I say yeah, read the book. a lot of bad things too, you know? So I just called it as it was, how I experienced it. And you can take it for what it is. Um, I'm grateful to have been given the opportunity to serve my country for sure. And I'm glad that I did choose the CIA over soft or something like that. Um, I had a hell of a ride and uh, I'm glad I did it for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, um, you know, you, you certainly would not be deterred uh, because when you, you graduate the farm and officially become a, uh, a case officer, yeah. uh, you know, all you want to do at that point is go into a war zone, as you said. And in fact, you had been given a chance to fill out a form with what division you prefer to join. <laughs> but, yeah. but you didn't, you didn't choose a division. I'm going to quote you, right? So uh, yeah, I know what I did. <laughs> you, you, know what you did, you said, you know, <laughs> you wrote down on this form, you wrote, whichever <laughs> yeah. division is willing to immediately send me to Afghanistan, and then yeah. your second choice was kind of a sarcastic joke. It was either send me to Afghanistan or send me to the cooking division in the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and like you had this whole attitude at that point where, where like you also talked about how um, you said, I was determined to let management know that my days of licking boots were over. Yeah. So, so, so you walk into HR wearing a t-shirt and jeans and they tell you, <laughs> They tell you that because you didn't choose a division, yeah, that you were being sent over to Baghdad in Iraq, yeah. right? Yeah. And that they and that they were going to groom you to go to the Near East division, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, no, that's exactly what happened. And yeah, like, uh, well, yeah. Look, you, I, so so they're like, this is the CIA, right? You're like you're like there for you know you don't really specify, and that's fine. But like a year or two at this point, whatever. Yeah. But like you're, yeah. you know, you're a neophyte and you're yeah. like walking in and saying, no, I ain't going to Baghdad. You got to send me to a, like, so you were, you, you were alluding to this before. What did you actually say to them? Yeah. I mean, so that has, I have heard from former colleagues who are still there that it has become agency lore, that form that I submitted. People still talk about it. Um, how I was a cowboy for doing that. Uh, so a couple of things. I mean, yes, I did submit that like that. And I showed it to everybody in my like classroom down at the farm. And they're like, no way you turn that in. And I was like, watch me. And then I dropped it in the box and they were like, <laughs> you did well down here. Like you could probably get any division you want. And I was like, no, because I only want to go to the war zone. And so That was all I wanted to do. So I didn't really give them an out for two and three. Yeah, I wrote like, I want to work in the contract. I don't know if I said it in the book who it is, but they contract out to a specific company to make the food in the cafeteria. So I put that corporation's name. And then for three, I put, I want to be one of the people that escort non-cleared people around and show them the CIA museum. And that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So when they saw it, it pissed them off because I was being a brat. Here's why, though, is I, and again, they let me navigate that furball for several years. I started to also understand their bureaucracy because don't forget, it is one. Mm -hmm. And so I started to figure out how to get what I wanted 
by navigating a bureaucracy, okay? It's not like the military, all right? It's not, it's a federal organization. So if you ever had to deal with the federal government, the IRS or whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Like it's going to go through 50 decks before it gets to the right person and it, it's going to drive you insane. Um, so I knew that I had a lot of leverage and pretty much the ace of spades to talk, not talk to them like that, but like say what I said and do what I did because a vast majority of my colleagues had wrote on there after their top three divisions, like an asterisk saying, I just want you to know that I have three children and a spouse. And so I cannot serve in the war zones. A lot of people were writing that on there. Right. And so many people did not want to go to the war zone. In fact, some got sent there with the promissory that, okay, John, when you come back, yes, we will let you go to Paris. And so it's kind of like a horse trade. I don't, I honestly don't know anyone but the paramilitary guys who asked to go there. So I was the only non-military guy that I know of. Again, I'm only speaking for my class mm -hmm. that went through the farm. Of my class, I was the only one who said, absolutely, unequivocally, it's Afghanistan or bust, and it's black site or forward operating base or bust. And I knew I could go all or nothing because so many people had said, please don't send me to those places that I knew they needed to staff them. So it was like, please don't send me to you know japan because i speak japanese like i'm begging you to send me to the war zone where most people are begging not to go so this is a one-to-one -one. it should be easy for you and so this is me telling you i'm going to do it this way and so yeah i look at it now and i understand why some people that review me on like amazon go this guy's the most arrogant asshole of all time. What a douchebag bro fratster guy. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's called taking calculated risks. And I did it my entire career. And that was a calculated risk because to be completely honest, that person who I told that to, who I like described as this disgusting yes. person, <laughs> and I did it. I'm sure she was not happy if she read the book, uh, but I did hate her. And my thought was F you, but she could have flattened me. Absolutely. I mean, she would have been like the equivalent of a rank of either a one star general or a right. colonel. So it was like me saying that to her was unheard of, but she knew the I wasn't joking. And the flip side would he's leaving and we just spent millions of dollars on this guy over several years to train him. And he's just going to go skiing now. Are you kidding me? Right. Ugh, God, what a brat. All right. Give him what he wants. So yeah, I know I look like a moron for doing that, but I guess I did get what I wanted in the end. So whatever. Yeah, well, I, I you know, again, for, you know, I don't know who else is reading the book, but I think a lot of people are reading that book and saying, fuck yeah, this, you know, this guy is <laughs> determined and he's yeah. not taking no for an answer. I mean, it's great. Yeah. And so you got, you know, Doug, you got your wish, right? They put you, yeah. so they put you yeah, in a language some. training program to teach you sure. Pashto. Yeah. Uh, after which you are sent to Wadi, if I'm sick, but yeah. it's not a real, it's not the, it's not a real name of the place where you were sent. You obviously keep that, that's redacted, that right? So we're using the yeah. name Wadi, which sure. you described, I'll quote you here, just about the most dangerous place on the planet for someone working in the U.S. government. It was yeah. like Deadwood with RPGs, pickup trucks, and AK-47s. Yeah. What was it about Wadi that made it look like the Wild West? <laughs> well, if I can't say where Wadi was, but mm -hmm. I'm sure you and listeners or viewers are smart enough to figure out that if I told you the location, you would go, oh, well, of course. You know, so right. just think about that for a second. Like, yeah. well, that's because it's located here. You would go, Oh, well, yeah, duh. Of course, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in that region of the world. Um, and the other base that I went to, which I openly named Shken, was the most dangerous place in the world at the time. That's why I wanted to go there. Um, check that box. Um, but yeah, Wadi was probably number two at the time. And I don't just mean places that the agency sent you. I, mean, I really do mean, and this is no braggadocio, it's why I chose them like worldwide everyone in the world knows like 
oh yeah, if <laughs> going there is probably the, you're going to die. Like, you know, if you were just as an American to go there, at minimum, you're going to be kidnapped for sure, 100%. And <laughs> your chances of living are 2%. So like, no one goes to that location or the other location as a journalist or anything, um, because it's a death wish. So, I mean, you know, I'm not, I was pretty well protected, obviously, and I was running clandestine operations mm -hmm. and we had the military in the vicinity and I had the Scorpion guards to like help me and escort me and they were former SEAL Team 6 guys. So you couldn't ask for a better escort than that. Mm -hmm. um, but so you just had to make your decisions accordingly. But yeah, Wadi, that was my first place I ever deployed to. And I'm not going to lie, I was pretty scared for the first couple of weeks for sure. Definitely. Yeah, you know, you talk about, you know, the the other place that, you know, you mentioned. So it, as dangerous as Wadi was, you had a chance later on to go to, in the book, you call it Stone Firebase. Yeah. Um, but I, here, I'm going to start quoting again, because here's what you said about it. Through the swirling dust, I spotted, as you were heading to Stone Firebase for the first time, you said, yeah. I spotted a tall watchtower and the walls of the base. A firefight was in full yeah. heat. <laughs> yeah. I saw tracer rounds ripping, uh, ripping off and zipping into the surrounding mountains. The whole base <laughs> was mad with energy. 50 yep. cows clanged, rockets and mortars tore into the night sky. Holy shit, I said to myself, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I had read reports and heard stories and had mentally prepared myself uh, in fact, one of its uh, former, one of what um, Stone Firebase's former commanders had dubbed it the evilest place in Afghanistan. Yeah. But you said, now I was actually here and it was fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right so, on. so again, like <laughs> you like want to go to these places. And what I'm wondering yeah. is um, what was your obsession? with wanting to be in the middle, in the middle of the worst places on earth, essentially the most dangerous war zones. What drew you there? Why? Uh, well, I think it's the same as like, if you look at somebody who like has a yacht, for example, and you're sitting by like a river or whatever, and you see somebody go by with a yacht and you're like, man, how did he get that? And then if somebody knows who that is and they go, Oh, he was in sales. If I hear that, I go, well, then I could do that. You know what I mean? Like, why don't I have a yacht? I, I should, I should, I'm going to, I'm going to do with that guy. If that guy can do it, then I can do it. So, but if you throw me a basketball and go, Hey, do a 360 dunk, I'm going to go, it's impossible. Like I'm 5'11. So no, it's not happening. You know, I can't do a 360 dunk. So I was able to measure, like, could I do that? Would I do that? Yes, I would do it. I want to do it. Could I do it? And so I started seeing the people who were there and just in speaking with them and what it's like and how austere it's going to be. Can you do that? And then once I made it up in my mind that, yeah, I live a pretty Spartan lifestyle, even as a civilian, you know, so <laughs> like I, I don't have a lot of decorations. You know, my place is pretty bare. I eat pretty simplistically and live a pretty simple life. So it's like, yeah, I could, I could operate there. And if those guys can do it, I can do it. And uh, so, yeah, I guess it was just sizing up who was doing it before me and going, yeah, that guy's pretty ultra, but uh, if he can do it, I think I can do it. So I'm going to give it a shot. And, uh, you know, just proving it to myself, like, yeah, I can physically do that. And mentally I can do that. So I'm going to do it. I want to go to the tip of the spear. If he went and we are going there, I want to go there, you know, like that's a really tall roller coaster and it looks pretty scary, but that's the tallest one in the world. Well, if that 12 year old boy wrote it, then I can definitely ride it. So I'll get over the fear and I'm going to ride it. So I can say I rode the tallest roller coaster in the world. And I don't know. I mean, I don't, again, I know a lot of people and I see interviews and they make me laugh would try to sugarcoat it and go, well, it's just, you know, my patriotism and my heroism and this and that. And I just go, no, fuck all that. It was, that was the most dangerous place in the world. Everyone knew it. And only people who were squared away went there. And so I wanted to prove to everyone as well as myself, 
I am a Warzone CO. I'm pretty proud of it. And I want to go there and I want to mix it up. Somebody's got to do it. So it might as well be me. And so I did. And uh, again, like I'm grateful that they sent me and believed in me and trusted me because that's a dangerous spot. But, yeah. um, you know, I came back and with all my fingers and all my toes. So I'm glad I did it. God bless. Want to go back now. Want to go back now. I can promise you that. <laughs> I got too much to lose now. Would you still go running with the Bulls? Probably not. I think about that. I'm not as fast as I used to be. And I'm probably <laughs> 20 pounds heavier than I was then. So, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. You just, you get, you know, this, you get older and you in life and you start to look at it and go, man, I got a lot to lose or, Oh man, I took a lot of risks when I was young and fearless and careless. And now I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't really feel like running that fast again with two ton animals running behind me. Yeah. With spears on their head. So, <laughs> Yeah. Pass, pass. So you, so, okay. So you got there in 2010 and immediately, so this is interesting because you immediately noticed a massive strategic oversight. And that was that the agency had a a special branch dedicated to tracking Al Qaeda, but not one for tracking the Taliban yet there were maybe only, as you describe it, about 100 Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at that point, and tens of thousands of Taliban in the area, killing hundreds of Americans every year. What what the heck was that about? Uh, Well, I don't think anything's changed in uh, 10 years in the past decade. For example, on Monday, I think it was, 63 wounded and 11 killed in an intelligence directorate office in northwest of Kabul in Afghanistan. And I couldn't find it on any of the major networks or on the New York Times or anything. And, and it's yeah, it because no one cares, you know, I mean, call it what it is. No one cares anymore. It's called war fatigue. And we just don't care anymore. And it's like, you know, we're still at war, right? Like we are still actively spending billions of dollars. You do know that, right? Okay. Well, I guess nobody cares. Let's talk about these other things that are dominating the news right now. And we don't care about Afghanistan anymore. I mean, you know, who they just had a failed presidency in like March, you know, you got two guys saying, no, I'm the president. No, I'm the president. Well, I'm the one who won. Well, I'm the one who says I'm the one. And so it's like, does, is anybody noticing that we have a failed state again and 10 years later okay cool um so yeah uh i i think that's a a big part of it it's just just lack of interest and nobody's really paying attention to it so with regards to taliban nobody really cared 10 years ago either and again i know somebody will hammer their fists down to that and go yes we did and we lost a lot of lives fighting those sons of bitches and I'll say, yeah, but it wasn't the operational directive. It wasn't the priority. The priority we all knew was always Al Qaeda. And on top of that was Osama bin Laden, one man. And that was the priority for sure. And um, that's why we had entire units dedicated to finding this one man. I mean, watch Zero Dark Thirty. It's an excellent film. I actually liked it. But there's whole divisions, div- you know, units and centers dedicated to finding this one guy. And it's like, I'm out there going, well, yeah, but the Taliban is the one putting the IEDs together. And they're the ones sitting by the road with the triggering device. And they're the ones calling in the number when they see the convoy go by to send the code to the phone so that it blows up. They're the ones putting the pressure plates down in the middle of the night for when you drive over it. Like, it's the Taliban who's killing us now, actively. Yes, we're at war with Al Qaeda as well, but we're in the backyard of the Taliban. So why aren't we really focusing on them and let the separate units, yeah, focus on AQ. But it was like, Doug, these are our priorities. And so I kind of just, and it sounds bad, and I hope I don't sound like I'm complaining, but I just made up my mind, fine, I'll fulfill your priorities and your directives that you want. And then I'm going to do my side stuff as soon as I get those boxes checked and out of the way. Mm. And so uh, that's why, you know, a big part of the book is me pursuing this guy Wolverine. That was just something I decided to do on my own. 
and uh, just it became so, my everything. Yeah, I mean that's that's fascinating. I mean, so we're going to get into that, right? Because like you you talk in the book about how and uh, like who wouldn't assume this, but like you thought when you got there, when you got to Afghanistan, when you got to Wadi. You were under the assumption, rightly so, I would think, that you were going to be given a thorough briefing with yeah. a clear set of targets and objectives, but, but that didn't happen, right? Yeah, it didn't happen, but look, I say this to give perspective to everyone. We haven't been in Afghanistan for 19 years. We've been there one year, 19 times. You talk, yeah. And anybody who worked for the Foreign Service or for the CIA or for the U S government and who served a year rotation in Afghanistan would know that there really is no continuity of learning, you know, and of experience because you do a year there and you're like, God, that sucked. I can't wait to get out of here. And then you never come back. So you're gone. Whereas you may do a six year tour if you're in the foreign service or something in Riyadh, you know, as a diplomat, or if you're a diplomat, you may, you know, go to Paris and get four years out of it. And so you are fluent in French and you do know everyone in the community. Um, whereas Afghanistan, by and large, no one wanted to do more than one rip, meaning one year or six months or three months or whatever. You know, no one wanted to go back. Whereas military, you see some guys, I know guys who did, in fact, I think you had a Delta guy on your show not too long ago. They do eight, nine, 10 rips. And you're like, Huh? Like, whoa, wow. Yep. And so, you know, I think I did a total of two years, maybe and a half. So what is that, 30 months? And I spoke the language. Um, but then once I left, you know, I only did like my Syrian stuff for about a year after that, and then I quit. So like anything I had learned, it needs to be in the historical cable traffic for again, those that are coming up to read and review if they want to. Um, but otherwise that, that knowledge is gone, you know, it left with me. And uh, so, but like when you leave, like when I left, the person who came in behind me, um, thankfully was a guy that I was working with out there. He took over the Wolverine case because he knew how important it was. Mm -hmm. But my replacement replacement uh, who came in, I never met him. And he wouldn't have known anything about my cases or anything. I never got a chance to go, okay, this is who this guy is. And he really likes pistachios. So have them. Um, this is this guy. And he'll be offended if you ask him about why he wears the, the pink like hat that he wears, you know, so don't ask him about it, but here's why he does it. You know, whatever, all of these insider, you know, tidbits mm -hmm. that could help you with the case. Um, and it really screamed in my face and rang true because Bob Bear had talked about that and see no evil about how he was driving the streets of Beirut. And uh, he is talking to the guy he's going to come in for. And the guy's like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm really busy. I got to get to the airport. Um, I think this guy needs a raise and that guy probably needs terminated. So anyway, I'm going to drop you off over here at your house and I got to get out of here. Uh, you know, best of luck. Habibi and then like drove away and Bob Bear's like really like wow and then he goes to his first meeting and learns that that guy who just left uh was trying to proselytize and uh get this asset a CIA asset to join the Church of Latter-day Saints and so Bob Bear is like wait what and he's like yeah we had prayer meetings are we gonna get out the Bible now and Bob Bear's like no we're not getting out the Bible. Like we're going to talk ops. And he's like, Oh yeah, we usually just prayed. And so like, I started to experience some of that stuff too in the field. And I'd be like, what are, what are we doing? Like, wow. Oh my God. So yeah, with the Taliban stuff, I, I just think we were, uh, and again, I'm not trying to give a black eye to the CIA. I love the CIA with all my heart. Um, but we were really myopic back then. And we just, we wanted to fucking kill Osama bin Laden so bad and had spent so much time. It's kind of like an investment where you're like, well, we already spent 10 years. Like what's 11, you know, what's 12, you know, like shit, we got this much invested to it. We might as well keep her going. And, uh, 
yeah, that was the exact time I was there during the surge and everything else. And it was just a very weird time. I would love to see how it's been since like 2013, what they focus on and why, I don't know. And I have no right to know, but it would be interesting, certainly, given what I went through to see like what the focus is now, because we killed bin Laden and Al Qaeda is barely existent and ISIS and all of that. So I'd be interested to know what the mission set is these days. But again, right. that's that's in the past. So, so okay. So, you know, as you said, you know what? You, you get there, there's, you know, there are no real targets or objectives. You know, you're going to tick some boxes, but you've got this side project. And, you know, the book kind of gives the impression that, you know, you took this on as your mission off your own back. But yeah. you, you soon uncover through reading reports, you know, learning what's going on in the area in Wadi. You start very quickly, you wake up to the fact that there's an IED network out there and it yeah. is killing hundreds of Americans inside yeah. Afghanistan. And you're like, you know what? You're gonna, you decide, and again, you don't really state that in the book, but I think you just made it clear of that. Cause I was gonna ask, did they give you that as a mission to look into? Or did you, did you just say, no, I'm gonna stop this or I'm gonna try? Uh, well, I don't know if it got redacted or not. I know at least this quote retained. Uh, when I started to pull those threads on the Wolverine network, and where he was getting his supplies from, I think that specifically got redacted, but I found out where he's getting like his chemicals, right? And where he's mixing his chemicals and where he's training uh, young men to assemble IEDs and how to plant them and so on and so forth. Um, the reports officer's response to me was, if you send this out, you will have the eye of Mordor shine upon you. And I was like, and he was like, the entire intelligence community is going to flip out if you make that accusation. I was like, it's not an accusation, it's intelligence. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, but we really need to have backup on that one. And so I was like, isn't that what I've been doing? Like this source and this source, and this is corroborated by this guy. And here's a phone number, which we traced, which talked to this guy who we know is a known terrorist who talked to this guy and guess who he talked to. So of course redacted, but that guy. So I'm right. Do you see, you know, and the reports guy was like, I do see it, but oh man, that's gonna, that's gonna piss a lot of people off. And I'm like, I don't care. That's my job. And uh, so they sat on that for quite a while. And uh, I think another quote that I had, which I know got published, was the U.S. government is a gigantic warship, and it takes yeah. a real long time to turn around. But when it does, it watch does. the fuck out. Right. Because all barrels will be pointed. Because they took the time to turn around that warship. Oof, trust me, they're going to come to destroy. So once I, again, watch me hyperextend my elbow, patting myself on the back. Uh, once I got that warship to turn around, there was no, they were in it with me at that point. And they're like, yeah, okay. N you know, no expense is too high. We're going to destroy this motherfucker. And it was on and I knew it was on and it was like, here we go finally. But it did take a lot to get there. Okay. So, and we're going to get, we're going to get into that. Um, so, okay. So you're, you're like, you're, you know, you're going to, you're going to make a dent. You decide that you're going to dedicate yourself on the side to making a dent uh, in the Taliban itself and shutting down their IED network. Um, and, you know, you, you begin, you begin to aggressively recruit sources. Yeah. And, and you made a point, you know, um, to say, and I have the quote, I, well, I had what, what you were talking about here. So um, you said, as far as agency case officers were concerned, um, they reacted mostly like journalists, writing reports about attacks and suicide bombings, but they were not very good at developing accurate intel. Yet you now come into the picture, you decide, I'm going after this uh, network, and you start recruiting, aggressively recruiting, um, you start aggressively recruiting sources. Uh, 
that start that actually start generating high value results. Um, you name these guys, of course, they're not the real names, but you got Ajmal, Abdul, Haji John. And yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quote you here now, because what you start learning, as you, as you actually started alluding to about the, the stuff you were learning was like, no one wanted to hear it, but for the, you, I'm gonna quote you. For the first time ever, like we were getting information from inside, and you, you, that's parts redacted where you were getting it from, about what was going on in a Taliban um, education, whatever it was, and specifically how young, uneducated Muslim kids were being transformed into martyrs prepared to attack the great Satan. Yeah. So you start, you know, you start getting a first peek into what that whole thing is like. No one out being there for 10 years, no one, no one understood that or saw that. So I, the first thing I wanted to ask was, so did they have, did the Taliban have an organized indoctrination program? Is that something you're allowed to comment on? Yeah, I'll talk about the Taliban if you want. I mean, no, they're highly disorganized, which makes them ever more impossible to track. You know, I mean, like if you look at the mafia and you've, we've all seen these tropes go even to like Donnie Brasco, right? Mm -hmm. The guys all hanging out of what's known to be the mafia den or like the pool house that they all hang out at. Like those six guys are in the mafia. The very fact that they're talking casually with that mafia Don, they're in the mafia. The Taliban, they're going to train those kids I described in a mosque or a masjid. And so you're going to have 400 people come out of that. Who's to say who was trained how to assemble an IED? You don't know. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I do want to make a point, though. You said recruiting, at, uh, aggressively recruiting, just to uh, separate that, and I okay. think it's important, is aggressively developing. And here's why I want to point it out. So okay. your career in the CIA, if you're a case officer, which, by the way, I also want to point out, again, this is me blowing out my elbow. If you're a case officer, that's the only person that's technically a spy. You are a field operative, and your entire life and job is to steal secrets. You are a spy. No one else in the CIA should call themselves a spy. You're not, okay? And I know a lot of people are going to be pissed at me for that. Stop going on TV when you're an analyst referring to yourself as a covert spy. Mm. You're not, all right? The people that go out and take the risks that I describe in Left of Boom are called case officers, period, full stop, all right? Yes, some other people can go to the farm and they can get the same training, but the only people who are tasked in their entire job is to go out, recruit sources, steal secrets, are case officers. So your entire job and how you get promoted is on how many recruitments you get, which is a solidified literal like a sale right like they signed on the dotted line i'm going to pay this amount for your product and now you're shipping it to them the recruitment is an official document and it's an official process that says this guy that's stealing secrets for me mm -hmm. now is officially stealing secrets for me and so it's a big deal in how your career promotes so why do i point this out if you are a case officer and you want to get to the top and by the way, you're from like an Ivy League school and you've always been competitive and you've always been in the top clubs and you got into the best university and you went to the top high school and you got a 1600 on your SAT and you always, you were great at lacrosse and you competed in that and so on and so forth. That You've always had this great success. Well, your career at the CIA, you want to be a fantastical success as well. And so you want your trajectory to keep going up with promotions. We're on a GS scale, GS 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, similar to, I guess, like 0, 003, an officer, you know, 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06 in the military, 06 being the colonel. Um, but they want to progress because that's what they want. For me, rather than recruitments, which is how I get promoted, I didn't care about recruitments. I cared about eliminating that IED network. And so mine were mostly developmentals who I knew from the day I met them, I can never recruit this guy. He has finite information that will expire in two months. Or once I get what I want from him, which is that guy's cell phone number, he's useless to me. 
So I was developing hundreds of people uh, to do operations for me uh, around the entire region, not just in my base, but to go to different parts of Afghanistan and so on and find things out for me, knowing that once they found that one thing out, they were probably pretty useless. So I kept turning and burning, as you see, and that's right. how Ajmal introduces me to Abdul, and Abdul's like, oh, well, I know Haji John. Well, once I got to Haji John, it was like, who do you know? And those two guys aren't really important to me anymore. Who do you know? And then he introduces me to Mahmoud, who's like the yes. left-hand guy to Wolverine, and I'm like, okay, you're kind of done too. You are the only guy I care about. And then it was like, Mahmoud is recruitable because his information is that valuable to us. So I went through all these guys and many people would go, will you waste your time? Well, the only way I got to this guy was right. through turning all of those rocks over. And um, so, yeah, I just, I guess I kind of looked at it from a different perspective. And like, if you think of somebody in law enforcement, for example, their entire career is on their collars how many people they arrested that eventually then led to a prosecution and that person, you know, went to jail. Like that's how you're going to measure a detective. How many cases did you solve? Not how many did you investigate, but like how many did you solve? Well, I've closed 95% of my cases, you know, Oh, okay. Well, you're getting promoted saying I investigated 600 murders. I'm going to look at and go, wow, you must have some experience then 600 reps but you've only solved three of them. Why? Uh, because the area I worked in, nobody speaks to the police. Oh, okay, well, you got a lot of reps. So that was kind of mine. Like I turned a lot of people over. I had no problem terminating them. And I don't mean shoot them. Right. Uh, it means just fire them or tell them don't come back again. Didn't bother me. And um, so, yeah, I was able to run through a ton of people in a quick amount of time. So you're, yeah, and, and that's something, you know, that you realize reading this book is that, so we'll use the term developing and I get that now. Thanks for that clarification because like you were, the thing about you is that you kept thinking bigger and bigger. I mean, yeah. you know, it almost, you know, you, I mean, you started, as you said, you started going through this guy to get to this guy to get to this guy. And next thing you know, you're, you're developing this and this blew my mind. You're developing Taliban commanders. Forget about people that can talk to you about the Taliban or inform on what they're, what they're doing. You're actually now in the Taliban, with, and not just fighters, fucking commanders like Mahmoud, yeah. like you said, like yeah. uh, I think yeah. Mullah Rashid, Commandant oh, yeah. Khan, like these, some oh, of the yeah. names you came up with yep. here. And, and you begin to learn how these guys actually operate, which apparently from the book, no one ever even knew how uh, they assumed yeah. the way a Taliban commander operated. You actually found out this guy doesn't fight. He's actually a manager. He, you know, it, it, yep. it, right. I mean, that, that was yeah, just, it was pretty illuminating because everything I had thought beforehand either came from books I had read or cables I had read. Well, the books I had read are written by who journalists. Um, the right. cables I had read were written from people who had done the job before me, but they were pursuing Al Qaeda. So we were doing a lot about them. But the Taliban, I really had, and maybe I missed it, but I <laughs> didn't have a fulsome understanding that, like, when I met, uh, what did I call him? See, because I remember his real name right now, um, uh, uh, Mahmoud. Um, when I met Mahmoud for the first time, I think the first 10 times I met him, I just had him explain to me how he was managing his, his soldiers because. He'd be like, no, I don't live with them over there. I mean, that's where they fight. And I go there like every couple of weeks, whenever I feel like it and I pay them. And then I collect money from them, from money they you know, took from people in the village or collected on opium sales and stuff like that. But like, no, they're beneath me. And you're like, yeah, but you're their commander. Yeah. So like, you need to be watching them and making sure they're training. And he's like, training for what? And you're like, don't you guys like, fire at targets he's like why would we waste ammo and like because their mindset is just i have like a u.s military mindset of the crates of 556 will never run out and he's going right because each guy only has one magazine with 30 rounds in it so why would we shoot at paper we shoot at humans and it's like oh okay that makes sense you know and then just everything about him and then him explaining like the opium trade and how they openly sold 
openly sold opium in the markets of a lot of these cities and we knew about it and weren't doing anything. And he's like, yeah, we make millions of dollars. He's like, I got a pretty decent life, you know? And uh, I can't say that because it identified, but he had this one thing that was really expensive. And I was like, how do you have one of those? And he's like, I bought it. Where? He's like, I don't know. I think I traveled to like Saudi Arabia once and bought it there. I'm like, how did you fly to Saudi Arabia? Got on a plane. But you're Taliban. Nobody knows that. How do they not know that? You're a commander. Because I don't tell people, dumb dumb, you know. And but like to him, it was like he was talking to a child, like, right. how do you not know this? Of course I can get on a fucking plane in Kabul, you idiot. You know, and I'm going, this guy travels on planes to the Middle East. Like, what? He's a he's a bad guy who's killed people. And you know, the agency too was going, he what? He flies? And I'm like, on Ariana Airlines. He gets, he goes to the same airport as like the president. Like, what are we doing? Uh, and he was like, of course I fly. I can go to, I can go to Mecca whenever I want. Of course. Why not? I'm a Muslim. I'm entitled to it. Yeah, but you're like hunted and wanted by us. He's like, no, none of you guys know who I am. I walk through checkpoints with the U.S. soldiers all the time. Wow. So. You know, they have a term for it, shadow governor, shadow commander, shadow mm -hmm. Taliban, shadow this. So you can say you're the governor of Kandahar province or Helmand province, but everybody knows who the shadow governor is too. And so everybody knows in some areas of Helmand, the shadow governor is running stuff, not the real governor. Lashkar Ga in Helmand is the only place he has power. Go a little bit up north and talk to any Marine who served there. And they'll tell you, mm -hmm. no, the governor's the shadow governor. That so they'd say, which governor do you mean? You know, and the Taliban governor. Ah, the shadow governor. Yeah, here's his name. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I didn't know any of that pre going in, and that would have been really useful <laughs> to have that information. <laughs> but again, maybe I maybe I didn't see it in the traffic. Mm. Um, okay. The other, another fascinating thing was that, that you were actually able to, but what blew my mind is that you have Taliban commanders. They're, you know, they're fighting to the death to kill Americans yet like one after the other are happy to sell out the Taliban to you, yeah. give away like, serious information for money and mm -hmm. it, it's just like you know again outside looking in like you would think these these guys are hardcore they're fighting for their cause you know that they, they kill themselves before they give up any information about themselves and instead they're actually just fucking openly selling it to you um and it's amazing how how why is that in your assessment why were so many of them inside the command, the commanders inside the town? Why were they, why were they okay with selling their information to you? That comes down to a cultural thing. And again, this would probably get me in trouble, but it's my perspective and my perception of what I saw firsthand. Um, that's kind of an accepted way when you're in survival mode and you live in what I like to call a fifth world country. Um, you're in survival mode, and I mentioned this too, from the moment you come out the womb, you're in survivor die mode. And the probability that you may not make it past five years old is high. And so when you've been in that mentality through adolescence, through young adulthood, into adulthood, and now you're like 35, and you're still alive, you're like a senior elder. Like people look at you like, whoa, this guy's made it to 35. Like he's, he's deep, man. Like, listen to what he has to say um and so yeah i mean the mentality is like well yeah undercutting my fellow brother over here and selling him out is bad but i'm starving too and so if i undercut him and it damages him but benefits me then that's what i should do to keep surviving and it's a real mentality and so i mean one of the most perfect examples is Komen.com. khan who I never met in person, but I'd have these long conversations on the phone and he would say, look, I hope you die. I hate you infidel. You know, this is all in Pashtu. Like, I hope you run over one of my IEDs and you die. But if you want to know where those IEDs are, 
and you can get me this amount of money, I'll tell you where they're being placed and by whom, and I'll tell you when they're going to place them. So you can go and get those guys, but you're going to cost you this amount of money. And so, I mean, obviously it was worth, I mean, considering the exchange rate, what I was giving him, most people would laugh and go, you can't buy an ice cream cone with that, you know? So like, but to him, it was a lot of money. Right. And I was willing to pay a lot of money to him because it's saving, you know, you a soldier's life, maybe um, from running over what he would have been placed. Um, but uh, yeah, it, that was strange at first, but then I realized, oh no, this is a mentality thing. He knows if he works with me, even though he hates me, he's going to get a leg up and he's going to be able to survive longer than his contemporaries and the other people around him. So yeah, they might get captured or they might die, but unless they're like part of his really close clan or family, you know, it's like, oh, that guy's a Norzai. I'm an Achikzai. Fuck him. Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah, we're in the Taliban together, but he's not part of my clan. Like, bye. And I'm going to wow. get $50 for this. We're working with the American. So yeah, hey, Zmirai guess what? So-and-so planted this bomb over there. Yeah, he's in my group. I know because I gave him the bomb. <sighs> All right. You know, and then you send somebody out in the military who's braver than me and they got to go and disarm it, you know, or detonate it and take it off the side of the road. But it was one we didn't know about prior. Um, but yeah, that mentality too is so foreign to like an American, you know, or a Westerner like, well, yeah, you got to sell out other people to survive. Duh. And again, like I said, like when they're talking to me, explaining this stuff, and I mentioned like when I was in Wadi, one of the interpreters there, I call him John, I think, J-A-N. I mean, he would, he would talk to me too, like an infant, like, how do you not know this? Like, how do you not know that we do this? Or like, that that's acceptable behavior or this or that or blah, blah, blah. And I go, because like, this is blowing my mind. I can't process. And, you know, to the, even the effect where he said, no, no, no don't ever give me a leather chair again in a meeting. Make me sit on a steel chair or at your feet on the floor. I need to be viewed as less than you or they'll never respect you. And I'm like, but that's disrespectful to you. And he's like, you don't understand. Mm. You must do this. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's, that stinks, but you'll be sitting on a metal folding chair then next time. And the demeanor, it shifted and changed immediately with that individual I was speaking with is then he stopped looking at John and only paid attention to me like John wasn't there. So, you know, that's part of it, um, which I'm happy to get into because I think the PC mindset that we have, and I mean political correctness, that's something you really got to put on a shelf for a vast majority of your interactions when you're dealing in the fifth world because they don't give a damn about being politically correct when they're in full survival mode. Well, you kind of also made a point in the book about, I mean, if we're talking about that, um, we could take it one step further. You, you mentioned in the book about EITs, um, right? Enhanced interrogation techniques, how, sure. right? How, yeah. uh, you know, I guess in a politically correct context or in, uh, you know, a so-called civilized world, uh, we're not meant to put anyone through an enhanced interrogation technique. Let's just call it waterboarding, right? Sure. But- you talk about how in, in the book, you talk about how this got us information and the information it did get us was good information. Everyone says, if you do that kind of thing, you don't, you don't know if you're getting good information, but you talk about in the book how I did get good information. I, do you believe that EITs should be brought back? Uh, no, I don't think they should be brought back. Um, Okay. I'd have to look at exactly what I said because I have to be delicate talking okay. about that, what was redacted and what wasn't. I, I mean, what I'll say is that I do know the people who were involved in those types of situations. And look, again, I know there will be people who listen to this or view this who go, fuck you, man. Yeah, it was wrong. You're, you're the terrorist. Ugh. The people who were, the people who were approving that, we're carrying it out. And again, just go watch Zero Dark Thirty. Mm -hmm. it's, the first, it's the first scene. Um, they really did think what they were doing was right. It wasn't out of statism. It wasn't out of, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to be cruel or they were getting revenge or wanting to like beat up on some terrorists. It wasn't that, I mean, really. And 
I do know too, like psychologically, some of the guys who were responsible for that, it really fucked them up. I mean, this is what I mean. Like I came out of the CIA and it's taken me up until now to kind of be in the right mindset, you know, mm-hmm. and like adjust to civilian life. It took me like five, six years. And so those guys too, they're still struggling with like having to have really hurt somebody, you know, like that's a serious thing to partake in. So I just do want to say that for clarification, you know, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it. Yes, I do know that it did elicit pretty powerful information. Did it every time? I don't know. Was it unusual cruelty? I'll let you decide. But I will stand up and say the people that were doing it, it wasn't like what we're seeing now where, yeah, there are some like really terrible cops out there, obviously, who like abuse their power. Mm -hmm. Like the guys that were chosen to carry these things out, it wasn't done willy nilly. The CIA doesn't, despite, again, what people will throw an accusation out at. And this is why I get both ends of the spectrum, as I said, where people say I'm stumping for the CIA now. Um, they don't do anything willy nilly because they know it to be the front page. They contemplate and calculate everything down to the absolute maximum that you can magnify it. So the people that were chosen were the best of the best. And, uh, you know, they thought what they were doing was the right thing. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. You, I mean, you clearly didn't engage in anything like that. And in the, I mean, You just managed, and I guess, you know, if you talk about um, what you get taught uh, at the forum and your ability to actually understand cognitive conditioning and how humans actually think, how we process information, how to manipulate someone, you clearly see how you're, I mean, you you pull no punches in the book. You're talking about how you're, and, you know, at, at times I even think maybe you said once or twice that you felt bad. Um, for manipulating some of these sources. Mm-hmm. But um, uh-huh. in the end, you didn't let it stop you one bit to get to your goal, which was to stop this IED network, stop Americans yeah. from dying. Yeah. Uh, and you, you were so good at developing those sources, you end up uncovering something that is really, really interesting. You uncover the fact that uh, there's this guy that's leading this ied network we call him you call him the wolverine that's the name that you give him in the book yeah and what you want but what you uncover is the fact that if i remember this correctly that everyone thought that the ied network in afghanistan Mm -hmm. was being funded and run by the taliban yeah but through your efforts you start to uncover actually that's not the case at all that there's this guy there's this network the guy's not even based in afghanistan he's not taliban if i if i remember that correctly and this guy is responsible for 90% yeah. of the ieds uh in the country and in fact by the way Rumor has it, but now, uh, and this is what you were alluding to earlier, you were able to prove, at least, you know, from all the connecting the dots that you did, that actually, not only isn't this guy Taliban, but this guy's actually being helped by another country's intelligence agency. (laughs) That's what you end up uncovering. Yeah. I mean, Right. right? So, so, I mean, that's, I mean, just unbelievable so you you end up and i know you can't talk about it so we won't we won't dig into that but the fact is you find out who the wolverine is right you find out who this guy is and you um then proceed and this is the next most like amazing thing uh which i think you can talk about which is that you get one of your taliban commanders which is mahmoud yeah to infiltrate the Wolverine's yeah. organization. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to give you an idea of how this went about and also which was flabbergasting, I'll, I'll give you a comparison. There's a wonderful journalist, her name's Jo Leovi. She wrote a book called Ghetto Side, which was about South Los Angeles uh, over the past 20 years. And she followed a lot of detectives around who were investigating okay. homicides. 
And I spoke with her a few times on the telephone and she said everyone in the community always knew who was responsible for the murder. Everyone knows that was a concept. And I called her the first time or set up the meeting to speak with her. I said, because Jill, everyone knows is like a tagline of mine in that within, I don't know, six months maybe of being at Wadi, I knew Wolverine's first and last name. And I knew where he was operating out of. And then because I knew his name, I started to ask people and it was like, oh yeah, him? Wolverine? Yeah, everybody knows who that is. And so it'd be the equivalent of like being in New York and going, I don't know who's in charge of this Italian mafia family. And people being like, it's Don Julio. Like everybody knows that. How do you not know who's in charge of the Italian mafia in, you know, in the Bronx? Like, how do you not know? Everyone in the Bronx knows that. It's that guy right there. That dude with the blue jacket on. That's the Don, you know? And so once I start, it'd be the equivalent then of just going, so you're from the Bronx? Uh-huh. Do you know Don Julio? <laughs> Come on, man. Everybody knows Don Julio, you know? And it was so prevalent. Another tidbit. Well, several years after I left uh, the agency, I was at a cookout, and they were mostly Marines. and. Uh, one of the guys at the cookout said Wolverine's first and last name out loud. And he didn't know that I was former CIA, but he knew that I was working with the Marines now as like a consultant contractor. Okay. And I go, so I say Wolverine's first and last name. I go, who, who was that? And he goes, Wolverine? He's like, did you do anything with the military in like 2010 or 11? Everybody knew who Wolverine was. I'm like, Huh, really? And but keep in mind again, they don't know Wolverine. They're saying his first and last name. Right. And I'm go- and I'm going, what did you do? And he was like, oh, I was in 0372, which is like Marsoc Marine Special Forces. And I was like, so you were a raider? And he's like, yeah. And I go, why do you know who Wolverine's real name is? And he's like, everyone knew who Wolverine was, <laughs> dumb dumb. And then I was like, whatever happened to him? And he's like, I don't know. I think he got whacked out. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, we stopped hearing his name and he just kind of disappeared. So everybody figured he got killed somehow, probably by one of his associates. And I'm like, huh, how about that? And he's like, oh, yeah, he was a big deal. Everybody knew who Wolverine was. And so, again, like just taking that into consideration, the people that would look at me like, why are you asking me? I'm from the Bronx. Of course, I know who Don Julio is. Why are you even asking me that? That's stupid. You want to go see him? He's right over there at O'Shea's Pub that's where he hangs out. Everyone knows to avoid that place. Are you stupid? You know, it's like, so for me, they were going, he hangs out at this mosque. That's where he builds all his IDs. Everyone knows that. And I was like, everyone, because we didn't, you know, <laughs> like, holy right. hell. And so then it was, it became so much easier because I would just ask people like, hey, do you know Wolverine? And they go, yeah. How well do you know him? I don't know. Uh, my nephew delivers peaches to him. Every, he really? bring me your net, you know, and then it'd be like, Hey, you deliver peaches. Yeah. But my, my nephew delivers his cigarettes. They bring me him. Oh yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Well, my dad is a Taliban commander. Bring me him, you know, just like continuously going through it until obviously through, uh, Abdul and Haji John finding Mahmoud. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when I was like, wait, you have access to Wolverine. Yeah. I know him. Well, I talk to him all the time. Excellent. Found you. But what no one else knew, I'm assuming what they didn't know, was that uh, Wolverine was uh, being aided by a, uh, an inte- the intelligence arm of a government that was cozied up to the American government. And when you uncovered that, you wrote, you said, you said this earlier, you wrote, you wrote that report in the book, you talk about it, you write the whole report and your, um, and uh, boss man in, in the book, right. Says to you, um, we're not turning this in. Yeah. And you're like, what the hell are you talking about? We got to turn this in. We got to let, we got to let everyone know that these guys are not our friends. In fact, they're funding the IED network and you're like, and, and, and your uh, chief says, you don't understand. They don't want to know. 
Yeah. Can you, yeah. can you give some context to that? I mean, it's in the book before our, yeah. our listeners who aren't going to read the book. Yeah. How is that um, possible? So I won't speak about the allegedly alleged, uh, uh, benefactors that were helping the mm -hmm. Taliban that mm -hmm. was all redacted. So mm -hmm. I won't say too much about that. Yep. Um, I will speak to the part that you could read though, of like boss man, who was my idol and still kind of is to this day. I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, but, uh, just everyone going, yeah, well, you can't make that type of allegation. And you don't want to be the guy who pens that. You don't want to be the guy who authors that. And I was like, have we met? I already have the <laughs> moniker of like war zone cowboy. You know, like everyone in the agency, everyone, at least in the NCS, knows that like, it, like you said, I'm burning way too hot. You know, like I, everyone knows both ends of the candle are lit. And I have a flamethrower on each end and it's just melting wax, you know, like. That was my mindset because I didn't think about my career. And probably part of me knew you're not going to last long doing this. You're probably going to quit after three more years of this because you're going to snap. Mm -hmm. So like, just keep burning it until you burn your fingers. And that, I don't know, like, again, I know some people would hear this who are more reserved people and hear that type of mindset and go, this guy's a psychopath. This guy's crazy. Uh, he's a brat, he's a fratter, he's a, you know, he's boisterous, he's boastful, all the things that I've seen. Thank you, Amazon. Always makes my day and makes me feel good. Thanks for all your hatred and hate mail. So I'm not on social media. Uh, but nonetheless, other people, like if I sit down with most of your guests, like operators and shit like that, like mm -hmm. they go, I mean, we speak the same wavelength in the same language. And they don't think I'm being boastful. They think I'm being humble and shy. You know, they're like, no, man, but you, 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 you got rid of that Wolverine guy, right? Oh, yeah, man, you should have smoke checked him. You know, and then it's like, whoa, like they're going way past me. You know, like, right. hell, I thought we were at 55 miles per hour. They just passed me. So it's all perspective as well. And, uh, you know, I don't hold it against anybody who's like, wow, he was a large type asshole. I can't, we don't want people like him in the CIA. Whereas some people might look at it and go, maybe we could use a little bit more of people like him. I don't know. I'll let you decide. I had some pretty good results, uh, but in with a lot of baggage too. And so you can get some results, but do know it's going to uh, come at a price for sure. And you, but you were, but because of that, you were willing to put your name to this. Um, yeah. Oh, of course. But, but, what I what I what I want our listeners to understand is why wouldn't the CIA want to know? Uh, because once you put something out into cable traffic, it becomes official for like chiseled in stone. It okay. Can't, it yeah, it can be pulled. Yes, there are ways to do it, um, but by and large, almost nothing. Like you can restrict it, right? So mm -hmm. like if it's super top secret, it's going to be eyes only, right? So like it means like this, yes, will have to be sent from the base, but it's going to get to like cobble and somebody's going to print that off, put it in a zipped pouch and like take it to Washington, D.C. You know what I mean? Like it's eyes only, hand carry. You know, like we are not going to risk beaming this across the satellite. It's that important that rarely happens like that's that's like if you recruited like vladimir putin that would happen you, you know what i mean like right. that would be such a big deal that they would go hand carry that you okay. know what i mean like hand carry that back to us um so then and you can limit the amount you know how many people saw it you know that person that's carrying it probably hasn't even read it the only person who's read it is the highest up guy and he made the determination carry that back to washington dc Okay, and then you hand it to like the director probably at that level. I've never participated in any operations that would have had to have that level of security. But my point is, is that what uh, you alluded to, which I think was pretty heavily redacted, but you're a smart guy, so you were able to kind of probably put two and two together. Yep. Um, and I'm not confirming or denying. Yep. Uh, to, to make that allegation, would have been about as close to a hand carry as possible. 
that I can think of. Like that okay. level of considering what you're kind of reading between the lines and kind of figuring out may or may not have been going on. Mm -hmm. That's going to require Congress to have a big meeting about it. You know, that's going to require the Joint Chiefs of Staff to get together over something you wrote. And so it was like, I get it. And you got a lot of evidence, but it's still not enough. Right. And then, you know, it'd be like, I got the bloody glove. I got the knife. I got the fingerprints. And it's like, yeah, but they're going to send Johnny Cochran against us. You know, right. they're going to assemble the dream team. So you need more. We, we can never have enough. And right now is not the time to take it to that level. And so it got, it got, got it. squashed for sure. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, so you end up finding out everything about the Wolverine and the network and beyond, obviously, what we just talked about. But you get it all. You get, you get the sources. You get, you know, the people running it. You, I mean, you get, you get everything, right? And um, I even have it here. I wrote it down um, because um, of all the information that you, you had put together, how, how his network um, was put together, who the players were, who the suppliers were, the roots, the buyers, the end users, the different kinds of products uh, that they were selling. You had the whole puzzle put together. Uh, and then it was like, you, you, you also then were able to, as you said, point the Leviathan of, the, you know, turn Leviathan to put their aim on this guy. And yeah. when that happened, um, you were actually stateside and you, 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 were, you were home and it was your, I think it was on your, birthday yeah. that you find out that you you're one of your guys gives you a call and yeah. says hey we got him we got the yeah. wolverine and you yeah. were like yeah. I, because i think this is important for our listeners to understand this is i mean years and years of you taking the most insane risks yeah. doing what no one else is willing to do and you know just i mean everything that went into that and you hear that we got them. How did that make you feel? And what did you do? <laughs> yeah, he actually messaged that to me on our secure, like mm -hmm. instant messaging service that we had. Uh, I'm pretty sure I like started shouting and screaming and yeah, people were like, okay, yeah, I, I know I stood up at my desk. And I thought about standing on my desk and dancing, but I was like, I don't know, there's probably not enough room. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think my boss yelled at me at first. And then I went outside and I ran around for a while. And <laughs> just because I'm a maniac, man, I hear myself saying it out loud now. And I'm like, God, maybe this guy is crazy. Jesus. Um, or maybe that guy back then was. Hopefully I'm not still. Uh, but yeah, I just, I couldn't believe it. Uh, it came out of nowhere. I really didn't think that that operation was ever going to be cleared hot, as we say. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it happened it, without me knowing, and I was tracking that every day, what was going on in that case back from headquarters, uh, blew my mind. And uh, I just absolutely was elated and went out that night and broke my ankle as right, a result of, <laughs> of being so elated. So yeah, probably best I didn't dance on my desk. I would have fallen off and broken my neck. Um, but yeah, that I don't know. That's probably the biggest accomplishment of my life. I think so far, maybe I guess it's pretty cool. It's, yeah, I mean it's, yeah, yeah, I mean it's yeah, I mean it's it's amazing. But now what I want to reference as we start winding this down because you're being very sure. kind you're being very kind with your time doug and i appreciate that no, that's um, fine. but then we look at you know you talk about you said it a few times now there's a price to pay huh. and and you know what a, a lot of the guys that i talk to a lot of our guests you know they're in the special the special operations community um, and we talk a lot about, you know, there's PTSD, there's TBI for these guys. Um, you know, there's alcohol, drug abuse. I mean, it's a cornucopia yeah. of, uh, of the price that you pay, uh, for burning yeah. the candle at both ends. And 
um, while you're convalescing um, for the foot, you know, tearing mm -hmm. your, your, your foot away from your tibia and your fibula, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> um, you find out that the authorities had to let the Wolverine go. Yeah. Do you find out they, they get, your, your guy gets in touch and says, you're not going to believe this. They, they let him go because they didn't have enough evidence or, you know, they yeah. couldn't make, they couldn't make the charges stick or whatever it was. And man, from that point, you start to spiral. You go into like a, yeah. you know, a serious spiral. Um, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about the price you paid for essentially like r ripping your heart out of your chest, putting it into that job and uh, doing things no one else was willing to do. What, talk about that price. Well, I used it just about five minutes ago, the analogy, but I assume it's probably how Janet Reno and Chris Darden felt when they lost the OJ trial. You know what I mean? Like, how could you possibly, you know what I mean? Like yes. they thought they had so much evidence, like, and they did. Obviously he was found guilty after in a yes. civil trial for obvious reasons. Um, but it was like, we can't lose, we're not going to lose this case. And I saw the great, uh, uh, series that FX did on it with John Travolta and Cuba Gooding and all of that yeah, and you see they 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 were like there's no way we lose this it would be impossible to lose we can't lose like this is airtight we got him and so for me too it was like we got him it's on the worship turned around it did its job awesome like there's going to be you know there's going to be something that's exacted upon him either he's going to get life in prison or he may get terminated terminated like who knows but he's with the government now and it's up to them to determine how they want to try him for his crimes and yeah it ended up like the oj case like he's not guilty you didn't present enough damning evidence we can't prove that he wore that glove you know or we can't prove those were his bruno molly shoes so it was like yeah you can't prove that he operated out of those moss and it's like, well, through triangulation of cell phones, yes, I can, allegedly, you know, and it was like, so everything that was given to them, they nitpicked it and discounted it and said, yeah, he's, he's not the guy. And then meanwhile, my mindset in CIA's was the same as like, I used the analogy earlier, people in the Bronx are going, no, that that's Don Julio right there. That's the, that's, that's the, that's the guy who's the head of the mafia. We all know this. So I had had hundreds of people go yes it's wolverine that guy right there in that mosque that's where that's where that's where he makes them trust me everyone knows to stay away from that mosque and so we're like everyone knows this like why are you people who arrested him being difficult i can't believe it and um yeah it was not just hard on me it was hard on the guy who took over for me i think i called him jimmy in the book i think um Yep. But super hard on him, super hard on boss man who found out about it. He was crushed and we all had devoted a lot of time. And, you know, like I said, just even to get the worship to turn around is considered like a huge win in your career. You got the worship to turn around now. That's a story for 20 years there. Um, and then to capture this guy and then to have him released was a real slap in the face. And that sucked. And, I took it really hard and personal. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I got out of it eventually, as you know, and started working for Boss Man again, which saved my life probably. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you know, the one thing that I say also sometimes is I'll see, I don't know, either a soldier or a former agency officer or something, and they're talking so lightly and carefree about their experience and i'm like we were were we in the same location like were we in the same agency like how did you not like maybe you were just better at managing the stress but what you know and i read some of the books that come out from people who say they were these undercover operatives and maybe they were maybe they weren't i don't know um but they seem so glowing and shiny and i'm like damn, what did I do wrong? Because 
I came out, you know, after I left, like, whoa, that was quite some adventure. Like, what the hell do I do now? Like, oh, man. And so I had some real struggles for a long time after I, I left. I mean, in, in the book, you talk about the fact that while you're still in, I mean, you know, because, I mean, because of the pain from the foot and because of everything just yeah. get, getting crushed like this, I mean, you drank yourself into essentially a heart attack. Stupor, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, in the showers. <laughs> um, I mean, it, yeah, it was, um, I don't know. I, well, I do know, and anybody who's been there, and I, I have a lot of friends that are, like I said, 0372s or SEALs or, mm -hmm. you know, Rangers, so on, who have been through way more than I have. Let's put it that way. Yep. And they they know what I know, which is like, once you're in the hole, you're looking up and you're like, oh, it's easier just to spend another day down here. So you just, and it's not necessarily depression so much as just like, <laughs> you're like, I'm in this process. I'm just consistently drunk and I'm not eating and I'm just kind of passing out of these bars and passing out on my couch and sleeping most of the day. And you get into that routine and you're like, well, to get out of this hole, I have to climb up there and that's going to suck. And that's going to be really rough. So eh, I'll just stay here for another day. And so another day turns into another week, turns into another month. For some people, it turns into another year. And it's scary. And uh, you eventually, you really <laughs> thank anyone who helped you and are really proud when you finally scale to the top of that hole and get out. And you're like looking down and going, whoa, that was deep. I cannot believe I went that far. Uh, glad I'm out of it for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was it was insane what you went through, what you put yourself through, and then you did make it out. You got your shit together, boss man. I think sent you <laughs> to Syria, um, and you went. Um, we won't talk too much about Syria, but I, I guess um, when we get to the when we get to the end, you you just decided that that's it. You've had enough. Why? So ultimately, why did you leave? The CIA. What? What was the? What was it? Uh, let me do a little CYA first, okay. so I don't get a letter to my lawyer from the agency. In the book, and a lot of it's redacted in the Syrian section. I never say I was inside Syria. I say I worked for the Syrian task force, and I was in the Middle East. Okay, I'm so, making it okay. Fair you're, enough. You're a smart guy. <laughs> Figure out what, take from that whatever you want to take from that. But I never specifically <laughs> said I was within the Syrian borders. So I just want. That is true. At that point, you I never did said not that. say that. If you think I was, then you're allowed to think that if you want to think that. So gotcha. there's my CYA on that. I never said I was inside that country. Okay. True. I was in the Middle East. Um, here again, you're going to get the same answer stripped away from any bullshit, which will be similar to what your first question was on why did I decide to join? Now you've come full circle to why I decided to leave. And uh, while it had been on my mind for a while, I think I talk about what the final straw was sitting with some colleagues. I think it was on Thanksgiving day mm -hmm. and realizing that all of them had this like solipsistic mindset of what they were going to do for the holidays and what they were getting their kids and for Christmas and where they would be vacationing in the, you know, Caribbean, you know, during the holidays before they had to come back uh, to this nonsense and just the cavalier, like nonchalant way they were referring to our career. It was like, okay, I could easily be accused of having taken myself and my job way too seriously, but I did understand having come from the war zones into kind of another war zone that we are dealing in life and death. And you hear that platitude a lot, like it's not life or death, dude. This was, this was literally, literally, this was literally life and death. It really was. And I was the person tasked with kind of trading in life and death with getting it all set up. Hey, you go do these 10 things that you're, 
I will get myself in trouble. You may end up taking someone's life, you know, mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. Or that guy may lose his life doing that, what I'm asking him to do. That's mm -hmm. all I'll leave it at. But like, I am trading in life and death, quite literally. And so it is life and death that we are talking about. Most professions aren't. This one is weird. This one's very rare air and we're breathing it. So why the fuck are you guys more worried about 45 days from now where you're going to be laying on a beach? You need to be in the here and now worried about what's going to happen to John Muhammad when we arm him and send him into the front line. Like that's what we need to be worried about right now. Mm. And granted, you're not going to talk about that. Obviously, like I said, at like Thanksgiving dinner, but just the happy go lucky mentality I had been watching even inside, you know, secret vaults and in high level meetings and people like, Oh God, this is such a cluster F. Oh, God, this is so annoying. And it's like, then fucking do something about it. That's your job. Go recruit somebody who can affect some change. You know, like what, why are you here? Like get, get your spurs out, get on your horse and make some shit happen. That's what I'm doing. I'm burning, again, both ends of the candle. I'm working 20 hours a day, dying doing this shit. So like, why aren't you? So to directly answer you, that got under my skin so far after how many risks I had take, taken and Wolverine getting released and me realizing, yeah, you can change anything. And I do believe that, but you need to also know what you're going to have to pay for that to happen, what the cost is going to be. And so I started to look at it and I was like, I could affect change if I stay in and I could turn this screw a couple rotations more and get it further advanced, mm -hmm. but it may cost me my life. Like I just got out of the hole and now I see myself wanting to jump right back into it because I can't deal with this shit uh, psychologically and emotionally. And then you start to question yourself as an officer, like, man, maybe I'm not as airtight as they thought I was because they thought, you know, I was the opposite of fragile and that I could never break, but I can feel myself cracking every day. Did they get it wrong? Or is this just too much? Can't I handle it? What's wrong with me? Okay, it's time to hang up my cleats, man. Like, these are unhealthy thoughts and I don't ever want to go back down in that hole where I was. So... Sorry, but I got to, I got to call it quits now. And that was hard. And um, I do miss it. it. I never thought I would leave ever, but I never also thought I would experience the things that I did. And um, it is what it is, you know. I, I say that sometimes and people are like, you know, it's kind of refreshing, but also bizarre how you just live life as it comes at you and you don't live i wish it were more like this i have the and as one of your other guests said the operational mindset of saying i don't care what you want it to be or wish it to be it is what it is now this is what it is that's this mm -hmm. this is the road we're on so speed up or slow down but th this is the road this is the zeitgeist of the moment so you can change and get off but not until we hit that exit so like you're in this right now, deal with it right now. And my right now was that exit might not come up until it's too late. Right. And so you got to get out of this, Doug, because you may not make it out alive. <laughs> so that's the honest answer. I mean, just from our conversation and from everything I've read in your book, um, it is clear that I could take you and put you in any environment. Doesn't matter if it was CIA in a combat zone. Uh, doesn't matter if it's business. Um, I, I mean, literally with the way you operate and the way you think, you would, ac you would accomplish any goal and rise, you know, in, it, especially in business where life isn't on the line. I mean, yeah. God knows what you would accomplish. Um, you have a, you know, you, you're just, again, you're burning hot. Um, and in the business world, you're not going to die. But I guess taking what you now know as this just super determined mindset that you had, 
um, where you were the guy who was who wanted to be in the middle of the fire, getting mm-hmm. it done. If if I was uh, a kid who, having read your book or having listened to this or any any of the other things that you do, was like, I want to be a combat CO. Yeah. I want to be a war zone CO. I want to do that shit. I want the CIA to make me, you know, have that that. Um, that limitless mindset. I want op think. I want to mm-hmm. be in the. I want to be in the thick of it. Um, I want the action. If I came to you and said, you know, like what, what do I do, Doug, to end up doing what you did, but also staying in and 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 not falling into that hole? What advice would you give? A, a young man or woman that wants to be a combat CO, what advice would you give them? I imagine I'd take the same initial path as that grizzled old CO that I talk about in the beginning of my book did with me and try to dissuade them and advise them not to do it and that it's not good for your career. And if you want a lifelong career and get to the top in the agency, don't do those things Mm. and then i size them up like he did with me and realize oh i'm looking in the mirror you know like that guy you know like that's what he did with me like oh this guy's just like me telling him no it's just going to make him burn hotter so i might as well give him what he wants or we're going to lose him and he'll go to wall street you know like you know that happens actually kind of quite a lot Mm. um so yeah if i looked at the person and really thought they kind of had what it takes and they were going to do it anyway and they were super determined my advice i mean my my wish going against what i just said i hope that there we're not still in afghanistan by the time somebody would go through all the training required to get out there like i did um but i i don't know i mean it would be a lot of platitudes of like be patient and all of this and all of that but um I I would just say the biggest recommendation would be know what you're getting yourself into because if you do take that career path, just know that you won't be the director. You know, like you're not going to make it to the seventh floor. You're not going to be a chief of station. You're not. And I know that there's so many people out there that would disagree with me, colleagues as well, who go, yes, you could. Absolutely. You could do a war zone and then go to Paris and then like then go back to a war zone if you want to or it, no that's superfluous like you're mm. no it's not like no if you do three war zones and they teach you the language of a war zone where it's only spoken there Pashto, <laughs> one place only like you you you're kind of relegated to that that's who you have become and yeah you could maybe get a gig somewhere in a nicer place and do traditional stuff but nobody really is going to want you because they're going to be like, all right, this guy's been here eight years, 10 years, let's say. And he's now like 35. He's never done brick and mortar before. Why the fuck would we want him when we can have a 25 year old? You know what I mean? And it's the yeah. same as like, you know, Kinsey Institute or whatever, McKinsey, like mm-hmm. there, or even wall street, they're going to go, yeah, well, we want the 25 year old. We can shape and mold. Who's, you know, going to be at the same starting line as you. Sorry, you didn't get started until 35, but we want the 25 year old who knows just as much as you at this point. So, right. Yeah. It would just be brother. Don't do it. But if you are insistent, like I am, then go for it, but know the repercussions and what's going to happen. And don't think there's a way of turning around the operational warship. There is no turning around the bureaucratic warship. Trust me, that is going to continue always on the path it's always been on and no one's ever turned that baby around. So don't think you're going to be the first. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, So now you are writing books, you're doing TV shows. Um, You're living quite an interest, you know, quite an interesting life. What, I mean, uh, do we, What's next? Do we have any, any, any more books coming from you? Yeah, I guess. Um, it's obviously a weird time right now uh, with the pandemic and everything. Like, mm-hmm. I can't go film anything. So prior to that, I mean, I had a show that premiered in January, I think, on Bravo called Spy Games, yep. uh, which did pretty well. So there may or may not be a season two to that. I haven't heard yet. Um, 
but if there is, I'll obviously do it. That was fun. Um, but I also had two book proposals out there in the publishing industry and everything was greenlit, but now with the pandemic and yeah. everything that's going on, they're like, we don't know if this is the right climate for it. We need to wait. Um, there were a couple other like documentaries I was working on and they're like, well, we can't film. Like we can't get 20 people together in a studio now, you know, like, so that's off that we can't zoom a documentary, you know? So I'm like, yeah, good point. And nobody wants to travel on airplanes. So I haven't been able to really affect any of the, like, what I call Hollywood stuff. Okay. <laughs> Since a lot of people accuse me of going Hollywood, they'll say, which is a slur, by the way. So <laughs> uh, I've, I'm, I'm, I went Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Um, so I haven't been able to do any of that. And the other thing that I was doing was teaching K through 12 I in a substitute that. capacity. And obviously with the pandemic, that's got shut down as well. So uh, I don't know uh, if I'll pick that back up or even be able to pick that back up either. So kind of everything is in limbo right now. Um, to well, be completely I, honest with you. I got to tell you, I hope we get another book from you. Uh, yeah. As I said, right I, I recommend this book so highly. Um, it is, Thanks. your story is fascinating, it, but the book is just, it's, it's a thrilling ride. Um, and whether it's your shows or another book, um, your content uh, is real and it's um, super intriguing. And you're clearly a very bright guy who just is like, you know, just dogged and determined and, and, you know, makes, makes shit happen basically. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, just thank you for what you did. Thank you for your service because most, as, as you clearly demonstrated, most in the CIA do not want to go into that hole that you went into. <laughs> right. But uh, you yeah. did. And, you know, it's just uh, amazing stuff, man. So thank you for that. And thank you for doing the show. Yeah, Lawrence, let me pay you a compliment too. You know, it actually has been pretty heavily circulated. Another moniker that I carry is um, that I don't do interviews. Uh, and yeah, I noticed see, that. I don't, I don't do social media, but I still am asked on a weekly basis by the big networks, by big magazines, by their corresponding YouTube pages, um, by shows, you know, talk shows, uh, to come on and be a guest. And, uh, I don't refuse them out of hand. You know, I'm not JD Salinger, you know, where I go, there it is. Now leave me alone for the rest of my career. You know, I want to be a hermit. It's not that because if you look, you'll see that I've given interviews to high school students before, you know, like those are on YouTube. And I, mm -hmm. and the reason is this, and so this is my compliment to you is when you sent me the email request, it was clear to me, you had read my book, you knew things about me, you cared and you were polite. And you said, I just really would like you to use my podcast and my YouTube channel as your forum to say what you want to say. And I said, Oh yeah, I'll do it. And everyone else to all of these big names that you've heard of, it's usually like, sent to my publisher, my book publisher, because they didn't find me on mm -hmm. Instagram or Twitter. So they're like, well, I could, he couldn't possibly maybe have a Wikipedia page or he couldn't possibly have his own web page that all I have to do is type in his first and last fucking name and I'll find his website and I'll find his email yeah. on the contact me here button, you know? <laughs> and so they're like, well, he has no Twitter and he has no Instagram. I'm gonna call his publisher. And so then the publisher will send me an email and say, hey, big name network or big name talk show wants you to be on this Friday from 4.05 p.m. until 4.15 p.m. to talk about ISIS. Can you make that or not? And used to be four years ago and three years ago, I pick up the phone and call that big name network and I get some 21 or 22 year old talent booker or whatever and they'd go like, yeah. Okay. So who are you again? <laughs> Doug Lowe? Yeah. Okay. I have here. So can you do 405 to 415? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You'll just talk about ISIS or whatever. What's your background? 
uh, I'm a CIA case officer. Great. That's great. Yep. So you're going to be on with uh, John Doe at 405. And uh, yeah, just go ahead and dial in. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm like, Jesus. Okay. Like you don't, what? And I've had people go, we want you to talk about espionage. And I'll say, well, what part? And they'll be like, well, you were an agent. And I'm like, well, it's actually officer. And then I'll have like a 10 minute conversation and go, you didn't read my book. Have you read any books about the CIA? Like, so wait, you're producing like a $10 million website that you're putting all of this effort into and you don't know the first thing about the first thing. Like, why did you contact me? Well, we saw you on that, on that television show with Pablo Escobar. Right, but that, did, that has nothing to do with my CIA career. That was just a, a thing I did for discovery. Yeah, well, anyway, so can you do this or what? Aren't you stoked? And it's like, one, you don't pay me. Two, I don't need or want your publicity. And three, uh, I don't get any value out of it in my mm -hmm. own life to go, hey, <laughs> look at me there. I'm on that YouTube page of that famous magazine. Who cares? Like, that's, that's dumb. So, <laughs> at least for me. But I know I have friends who, like, they love being on the various news networks to share their perspective and yep. but, man that's just not me so anyway my long-winded compliment to you is thank you for taking the time to you know at least know a little bit about who i am and once i had it figured out that you had put in the work i said you can have as much of my time on friday as you want and so that's why i been here to speak with you as long as I have and I hope there was some value in it and uh, anytime because you're a nice guy anytime you want to do this again or you need something from me at all just ask me and you'll probably get it so thank you thank you so much Doug for those kind words uh, and I, I would absolutely love to have you on again uh, and I really do hope uh, that you know we get another book soon Eddie I can't wait to uh -huh. read the next one I can't wait cool. to watch the next show um, you are a gentleman, uh, where, if, if our audience wants to learn a bit more about all the cool things that you're doing, uh, where yeah. can they find you? I do have a website. So yes. Also, if you don't find me on Twitter, which you never <laughs> will, so long as I'm alive or Instagram, <laughs> cause I have no photos to show you. Uh, I do have a website it's called two minute window.com. And again, if you know much about espionage, you'll know what a two minute window is. That's what we live within. It's called being on time within two minutes. Um, that's a real important part of tradecraft, the two minute window or the four minute window. Um, so yeah, it's the number two and then minute window all combined.com. And I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to promote any political or anything. It's just a omnibus of things that have been written about me or shows that I've done. So it's just a collection neatly packaged that you can see various things about me if you care. So it's there if you want it. That's great. That's pretty that, much it. That's fantastic. Um, Doug, again, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Have a wonderful weekend. And yeah. uh, I wish you tremendous success with all your endeavors. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again on this show. Cheers. Thank you.